This morning, as I've already mentioned, we're going to be looking at uh, the letter of 2 John, uh, which is something we haven't done in at least in the 20 years that I've been here, to my recollection, at least as I look at the website, <laughs> I don't see much uh, in this particular book. Maybe it's because it's covered in other areas of the Bible, which uh, certainly uh, much of it is. But as you know, uh, each letter has something that is unique about it. And I think we find something in this letter as well. Uh, I think it's also a wonderful summary, uh, although not quite as, as full as the, the first letter, which uh, reminds us of how we might know that we are true believers. Uh, in this case, summarizing it by these two words, truth and love. And I want you to notice how often those words come up uh, in this letter as I read it. So let's go ahead and read it. Second John, beginning in verse 1. The elder to the chosen lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, for the sake of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever, grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I was very glad to find some of your children walking in truth just as we have received commandment to do from the Father. Now I ask you, lady, not as though I were writing to you a new commandment, but the one which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to His commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves that you do not lose what we have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house and do not give him a greeting, for the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. Though I have many things to write to you, I do not want to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face so that your joy may be made full. The children of your chosen sister greet you. May the Lord bless His Word to our hearing this morning. I should mention we're not going to cover everything in, in this letter, but we are going to cover, I hope, uh, the substance of it. Now, as I've already told you, uh, John wrote his first letter uh, to, to show his readers, uh, those who professed to know the Lord Jesus Christ, those who believed in Him, that they really had eternal life. In other words, that they really were Christians that they really had the Holy Spirit living in their souls in a saving way. Now, it's interesting that John didn't tell them, as many Christians often do today in answering this question, that if you believed, you're saved. Uh, these already believed in the name of the Son of God. That's the ones to whom he was writing. But he was writing to them to show them that they had eternal life. He didn't just say, if you believed, then you have life. Nor did he say, if you prayed the sinner's prayer, you are sure of heaven. But what he did instead was he pointed to the evidence of that conversion, that change of mind with regard to the truth, and that change of heart that they really loved the Lord as he calls them to love. Do you want to know that you have eternal life and that you've been born again by the Spirit of God? Well, you have to believe the truth, John says, and you must love the truth enough actually to live according to that truth. Now, John deals essentially with the same subject in his second letter, as I've said, and he gives us not only, we might say, a refresher course on 1 John, although it has been a while since we've looked at 1 John, what it means to be a true believer, but I believe in giving us this, he also shows us or gives us the blueprint of how we might fulfill the Great Commission that the Lord has entrusted to us. Now, John begins his letter by uh, addressing his audience, 
and he writes to the chosen lady and her children, which is rather a strange greeting. It's one that we don't actually see elsewhere in Scripture. And it raises the question, to whom was he writing? Who was this lady? Who were her children? Well, some believe that he was writing to a particular Christian woman, perhaps a woman of prominence and her household. Uh, the, the word there, uh, chosen lady, the word lady in, in Greek, the word curia, is a word that is used to, um, as a title of respect uh, for a woman. And in this view, it would be a particular woman, perhaps a woman of prominence who had many children. <laughs> Well, others believe that John was writing to a particular woman, but that these children were not necessarily her physical offspring, but rather a church that was meeting in her house, and that's certainly possible. But still others believe that the woman herself was really not a particular woman, but rather a particular church, and that he was writing to the church, and when he says at the end of the letter, the children of your chosen sister greet you, he's not talking about another woman and her children, but he's saying that this church... What, uh, greet you as, as well. In other words, the woman would be the church. The, the children spoken of here would be her spiritual offspring or the members of that particular church. Now, I do think any of these views could, could be the right one, but I suspect the last one is really the correct one. And if it is, then we might look at it in this way, that these children are those that this church has effectively reached with the gospel that she was instrumental in bringing to saving faith in Christ. And if that's the case, what a, a vivid illustration of what the Lord actually calls us to do in the Great Commission. Think of it in these terms. What is the church in the eyes of Christ? But her, uh, His bride, we are the bride of Christ. And as the bride of Christ, we are to be, if I can use these, these terms, we are to be laboring to bring children uh, to, to birth in the Lord Jesus Christ through the gospel. Well, that's what this particular church was doing, and that is, as we've seen, the work of the church. And I do believe that what John writes to this particular church can help us to do that, can help us to, to give birth to more spiritual children. And we thank the Lord for each and every soul that He uses us to reach. There can be no greater privilege, no greater service to the Lord than bringing lost souls to faith in Him. So let's consider again the importance of the two main elements of the Christian life, which I've said before are truth and love, which are also the main elements of evangelism. We have to have both of these things to be saved. And we have to have both of these things to be able to reach out to others. So let's consider, first of all, the importance of truth. I think you've noticed that John used that word a number of times in this letter. He uses it in different senses, though. He used it twice to assure them that when he writes to them, he is telling them the truth. And he isn't trying to deceive them where he says in verse 1 that he loves them in truth. Now, certainly it's the gospel that gave him the power to love them in the way that he loves them, but when he says he loves them in truth, what he's saying is, I really love you. You know, I, I'm not trying to deceive you. I really care about your souls. Or when he says in verse 2 that Jesus is the Son of the Father in truth, what he means by that is that he really is God incarnate. That is a very important point in the Christian faith. We have to believe that, and we're going to see that in just a moment. But he also uses the word truth to refer to the truth that we are to believe, the truth of the gospel, the truth that we are to receive and hold dear in our hearts. He actually begins by expressing not only his love for them, but in verse 1, the love of all those who know the truth. And there he's referring to the truth of the gospel. He writes to them for the sake of the truth. He says in verse 2, that truth that abides in us and will be with us forever, by which I think he's referring to the gospel. Because it is those who hear the gospel and receive the gospel and who love the gospel, who hold it close to their hearts, that are true believers and that will bear this fruit that we're going to see in just, in just a moment. And he writes to let them know how happy he was to find some from this congregation actually walking in the truth 
or according to what the Lord calls us to do in the gospel. Now, I don't think we need to say too much about how important the truth is. I think we understand how important it is and how important it is that it abides in us, that we don't just hear it and say, I've heard that before. I understand that, so I'm going to tune out and I'm going to think about something else. Or I've heard that before, but, you know, it's, it's really not that important. It's important that we not only hear the truth, but as John said to his readers, that that truth abide in us and remain with us. We have to hold it close, which means we hear it, we believe it, we love it, and we seek actually to do it. We seek to apply it. That's what John tells us. Now, again, why is the truth important? It's important because it's the only way that we personally can escape the judgment that is due to us for our sins. The Bible says quite clearly, we come into this world on our way to hell because of our sins. We can only escape judgment through the gospel. That is the only way. Remember, that's what the table reminds us of. The Lord would not have, the Father would not have placed our sins upon His Son and put Him through such agony and such torture that even, even to uh, look ahead and to see what was coming up would make him sweat blood. He wouldn't make him do that if there were many different ways. It's only through the truth of the gospel that we can escape judgment, that we can come to know God personally, that we can be reconciled with Him, and that we can actually live lives that are pleasing to Him. It's also only through the truth that we can help others do the same thing. Now, perhaps we can better see just how important the truth is by the negative examples that John gives us here of those who don't know the truth or those who are actually spreading error, what the consequences of such actions are, or of believing things that are in error. John was writing to uh, this particular church to warn them about the many deceivers who had gone out into the world. And he points to one error in particular that um, was a denial of the incarnation, a denial that Jesus Christ had come in the flesh. If you can think back uh, far enough to 1 John, you'll remember that he wrote to them about exactly the same issue, that there were those that he called antichrists, those who were opposed to Christ, those who were seeking to deceive the church. And the particular thing that they were preaching was that Jesus Christ could not have become a man. He could not be God in human flesh. And the reason why they said that was because they had adopted a Greek idea that all spirit was good, but all matter, everything physical was evil. We, we call it, I suppose, a sort of a proto or pre-Gnosticism. Again, the idea that um, there's this duality between spirit and flesh and so forth, and spirit is good, flesh is evil. Well, they blended this with Christianity. And the result was that they believed that God, who was a spirit, must be good, but He could not have come in the flesh. They did believe that Jesus was God, but they denied His humanity. He only appeared to be a man. It was just, it was fictitious. It was a, 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 like a projection, a, a hologram or something like that. You know, it was, He looked like He was human. He looked like He was walking on the ground. He even left footprints, but yet He was really only spirit. Now, have you ever wondered just how important the incarnation is? You know, we're um, actually a week away from a Christmas, you know, s service as it were, Christmas Day. We think about the, the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, when He, being eternally God, actually took to Himself a human nature and was born in a, a stable and laid in a manger, became one with us. How important is it that the incarnation take place. How important is it that we actually believe in the incarnation? Well, without it, there wouldn't be a gospel. Without it, there wouldn't be salvation. Jesus had to become one with us. He had to become a man because man owed God perfect obedience. Man owed God the, the penalty for his sins. He owed the debt to God. A man had to pay it, and the only man who could have paid it was really a God-man in order that His sacrifice well, would be great enough in order to have even the strength to be able to do what He was called to do. If there was no incarnation, there would be no salvation. 
Well, if that's true, then how destructive was this teaching of these, you know, these false teachers, these deceivers? Well, John tells his readers that if they adopt what these people teach, they would lose any reward they might hope to have from God, and as a matter of fact, they would lose heaven. He says in verses 8 and 9, watch yourselves that you do not lose what we have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. And what do you think it means not to have God? Well, if you're not reconciled with God, you're His enemy and you're going to face judgment. If you go too far, if you don't abide in Christ's teaching, you will not have God. Now, that I do not believe could happen to a true believer, but it can happen to those who think they're true believers who don't hold on to the truth. You have to believe in the incarnation if you are to be saved. He says in verse 9, the one who abides in the teaching, the teaching of Christ, he has both the Father and the Son. Now, if this teaching is so dangerous, what is true about the one who would bring it to them and teach it? John says in verse 7 that the one who would do this is a deceiver and the Antichrist. Now, I don't believe that he means here that, you know, Antichrist in the sense in which we often hear the term Antichrist in, in terms of the last days and, and all this type of thing. But John was, uses the term to refer to one who is opposed to Jesus Christ. Think about what he says in 1 John 2, verse 18 and then verses 22 through 23. He says, children, it is the last hour. And just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. What John means is that, that these people who are coming and saying that they're promoting the gospel, far from doing that, are actually opposing the Lord Jesus Christ. They're standing against Him. They are deceivers and they are enemies of Christ. It's a very serious matter to deny the incarnation. And how does John say that we should treat those who don't believe in the incarnation? Well, he says, do not receive them into your home and do not give them a greeting. Now, by this, I don't think he means that you can't let them into your house. I mean, that's what we often do when it, perhaps if, if, we're, um, if we have the courage and we have the desire to see these people come to Christ, if we have some Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons come to our door, we'll, we'll invite them in in order to talk to them even though the, their errors are equally as dangerous as the denial of the, of the incarnation. But you're not bringing them in to help them on their way. You're bringing them in in order to try to convert them, in order to try to teach them the truth, not to listen to what they have to say or to help them. I think what John is telling us here is not that you're not to let them in the front door, but you're not to put them up for the night and support them while they go about their work, because that's how in the early church, the Christians actually were able to, uh, to do the work the Lord called them to do. They had to sleep somewhere. And where they slept were in those households where there were already believers. Believers would receive them into their house and take care of them while they were doing their work. John says, do not let them into your house. He also says, don't greet them. Does he mean don't say good morning, you know, how are you doing kind of thing? No, I think what he means here is don't greet them in a way you would greet a Christian brother or sister and so, as it were, give credence to the fact that they are actually the Lord's and doing His work. Do not treat them as a brother or sister in Christ because if you do, you'll be confirming to others, perhaps weaker Christians, that you should listen to these people, that they're doing God's will that they're actually speaking His message. John tells us that if we do either of these things, if we help them in any way, that we're actually becoming a partaker in their evil deeds. If we help them to spread their false doctrine, then we're becoming partly responsible for what it is that they're doing. We cannot help those who are teaching error, except to try to help them get out of that error 
and learn the truth. But you don't just gloss over it and say it doesn't matter. We do need to realize as we think about this, so which errors are we talking about that, that this would apply to? Is it just the incarnation? No, not just the incarnation. It applies to every non-negotiable of the Christian faith that we should never forget and always insist on before we embrace any other person as a genuine believer or do anything to help them in the things that they believe that they're doing for God. They're the same things that you and I need to believe in order to be Christians. It's always good to review the fundamentals, and th this is what we would call the fundamentals or the non-negotiables of the faith. Well, what is it that you have to believe to be a Christian? Well, you do have to believe that the Bible is God's Word, and you have to believe it's His Word alone, that there aren't several documents out there that, has, you know, that contain His Word, although certainly the Bible is quoted broadly, but not other religious books. It is the Bible alone. You do have to believe in the true God the God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the triune God. If you don't have that, you don't have the true God. You can't be saved believing in a false God. You have to believe in the true Jesus Christ, the one who is God and man, the one who was born of a virgin. You do have to believe in the incarnation, but unlike the Jehovah's Witnesses, you do have to believe that He is God in human flesh and not just some angelic creature that was made into a man. You have to believe that man stands in need of salvation, that he was born dead in trespass and sin, otherwise you're never going to see your need for a Savior. You do have to believe in the true way of salvation. That's one thing we've really been emphasizing in the evenings, by grace through faith alone and not by faith plus works. It has to be by Christ alone. And God must receive the glory alone. That's why it has to be by faith alone. It has to be received purely as a free gift of His grace. And here's something that is left out today and is a very serious, um, well, violation of the gospel. It destroys the gospel. You have to believe that the faith that God gives that is a saving faith is a faith that is not alone, but one that changes your life one that produces works, the works of love that we've been talking about in, um, you know, throughout the service. If you don't have a faith that transforms your life, you don't have saving faith because the reason why He gives it to you is that you might become more like His Son. Now, if you get these things wrong, you're not only going to end up being destroyed yourself, but you'll destroy anyone that you convince if you convince them, happen to convince them that these things are true. Now, what I, I wanted to say that just to point out that the Lord through John here is not warning us to turn away everybody who might disagree with us, right? There are differences that exist within the Christian church. All those differences are important. Of course, they're important. We've been looking at these things in the evening services. Uh, whenever we believe something that, that, uh, well, that the Bible doesn't teach, then we are hurting ourselves in some way. All of God's truth is important, but not all of it is as important. There are those truths that if we get them wrong, we lose, basically, we lose heaven and we lose any chance of salvation and we also lose that for anyone we, we speak to if we try to convince them of these things, but there are, all the, there are these other truths that the Bible teaches that if we believe them won't destroy us, but they will hurt us in some way. But these, what John is warning them against here are those things that will destroy you. Don't listen to those who believe these things, who teach these things. Do not receive them as a brother or a sister in Christ. Do not help them in, in any way to promote that message, but help them in the way that they need the help, you know, the greatest help, and that is evangelize them. Try to teach them the truth. Try to persuade them of what the Bible actually does say that Jesus Christ is God in human flesh. And actually, we, we should do that also even in the areas that aren't as important. But we, again, we do it as it were, you know, uh, brother to brother. If they believe the fundamentals, if they're true Christians, and that's quite a bit different than viewing them as an enemy of the gospel and seeking to evangelize them. Okay, so truth, as you can see, is a very important thing. 
Now, the same thing is true, secondly, also of love, because only, uh, we, we should say, uh, only the truth can produce this love. That's why truth is important. But love is important because it is the end or the purpose for which the Lord actually saves us in the first place. Now, yes, it is true that He saves us to glorify His grace, that we are going to be trophies of His grace throughout eternity, and that's a marvelous thought that God would place His love on us and save us when we were so unworthy. But we do need to realize that as far as, as what salvation means for us in this life, what it is to produce, how it is to change us, it can all be wrapped up in this one word, love, to turn us around from what we were doing to what we should be doing. When we consider what it was it that John was happy to see in these children of the chosen lady, well, he was happy to see that they were living according to the truth. Verse 4, I was very glad to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we received commandment from the Lord to do. And what did John mean by that? Well, he meant that by looking at their lives, he could see that they loved Jesus. And how could he see that? Well, in the same way that others can see that love of God in your life, they were walking according to the commandments. Look at verses 5 and 6. Now, I ask you, lady, not as though I were writing to you a new commandment, but the one which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to His commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. It's amazing as I read these passages in the New Testament, that there's anybody in the Christian church who believes that obedience is an optional thing. How can you love God if, if you're disobeying Him, if you're a rebel against Him? How can you say that, that you're born again from God when the one who is born again practices righteousness and doesn't practice evil, as he tells us in, in his first letter. I mean, what is the evidence that somebody has savingly believed the truth and that they are born again? The Bible wraps it up in one thing, and that is love. And not just any kind of love, but the kind that submits to God's commandments. Which commandments? All of the commandments, but particularly the Ten Commandments, which is a summary of everything the Lord calls us to do. Again, I would remind you what Paul writes in Romans 13, verses 8 through 10, which is what we saw in our meditation. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this you shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Now, as I've said, this, this is the end of redemption. This is the purpose of redemption, uh, to turn us away from being rebels uh, to turn us to being obedient sons and daughters, from those who disobey to those who obey, from those who hate to those who love. And again, I would remind you not just to love in any way we please. I mean, there are people in the world who think that they love. They're loving somebody else when they offer them, you know, uh, drugs or when they want to uh, spend the night together or sleep together. They think that's love or when they tolerate uh, everyone's religion, let's just all coexist. I mean, you've seen the stickers, right? Coexist. That's not love. They, they think that's love. Toleration is love. Let's just tolerate everybody's destructive behavior, that that's love. Well, no, that's not love because those things destroy us. Those things will lead us to hell. God tells us what love is in the commandments, how we ought to love Him and how we ought to love our neighbor. Jesus says that love is what is behind all that God commands. When he was asked what is the greatest commandment in the law, he answered, the foremost is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, 
and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The greatest is love. Well, what's the second greatest commandment? Well, the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these, Jesus said. Now, these are the greatest because, as Paul wrote earlier, as we just saw in our meditation again, love fulfills the commandments. That's why God gave us the commandments to show us how to love, and that's why He gave us the Holy Spirit to give us the ability to love. That is the fruit of the Spirit. Paul tells us in Galatians 5, and 23, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. There's no law against love because love is what God actually commands us to do. By the way, Galatians 5, and 23 is a summary of everything Paul said, everything Jesus said, and everything that Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 13, isn't it? He's talking about the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which God gives to us in redemption. And that is so that we will love like Jesus loved. Do you think Jesus loved? That's, you know, I don't know what people think about Jesus, but when I look at Jesus, He was perfectly patient, kind, gentle. Every one of these attributes He had in perfection. And that is our model. That is what we are to be like. But we can't be like Him unless we have His Holy Spirit spirit. And that's why love is important because we don't have this love. We haven't really embraced the truth the way that we should. So if you want to know that you're a true believer, this is what you need to see in your life. You need to look at your life and see whether or not you love God. Love Him enough to submit to His commandments, that you love your neighbor as He calls you to do that. Not perfectly because we can't, but consistently and with increasing intensity. We're growing in this love. Not that we don't have major setbacks and sometimes go right back to square one. You know, I mean, Christian growth is difficult, but that we are moving forward. We are growing in that love. So what John here writes is really challenges us in a couple of different ways. And the first one I think is this, is that if you don't see this love that we've been looking at, you know, this love that submits to God's commandments, this love that has these particular characteristics, then you need to check and see whether you really do believe the truth, whether you believe God's words, whether you're trusting the true God, whether you're trusting the true Jesus, whether you see the fact that you are a sinner and you're confessing your sins and turning from your sins and trusting in Jesus Christ alone. You see, if you've done that savingly, this love must be there because you really can't do it savingly unless you have this love. But if you don't see that love, you haven't yet trusted Jesus savingly. And if you want to be saved, that's where you need to begin. You need to embrace this truth. This is where you need to start. But if you do know God's truth and if you have trusted in Jesus Christ and you have this love in your heart... Then for our secondary purposes this morning, you have everything you need to be able to reach others with the gospel that they might be saved. You know, all you really need is the truth by which you were saved and enough love for your neighbor to actually reach out to them and love them in the greatest possible way. Isn't it funny how easy it is to give give your neighbor food if they're hungry or you know, help them if they're struggling in some way, uh, if they're having difficulty with their car, maybe go over and try to lend a hand and all these different things. But sharing the gospel is the most difficult thing. And yet this is the height of love, to share with them the one message that will save them from an eternity of hell and will actually open the doors of heaven. Remember, the gospel is the key to the kingdom of, of God, giving them the key, as it were, so that they might trust in Jesus Christ and be savingly reconciled to God and enter into heaven at the end of their lives. It's it's something that's free. It's something we've had entrusted to us, the message on how this can actually come about, and all we have to do is just tell them. It's it's the height of love to tell them this because of its importance to them. And yet, very often, 
we're not really you know, moved enough to do that. We don't have a love strong enough to do that for a variety of reasons. Well, may the Lord help us to overcome that because we do need to realize several things. I mean, God has entrusted us with the truth to share it with others. He's saved us for this purpose. He's given us the commandment to do it. He's told us that this is what honors Him and, and His Son. Uh, he's given us His Holy Spirit so that we will love them enough to do this. And yet, oftentimes, we still don't quite find the strength to do it. So what, what can we do? Well, again, we need to use the means of grace. And we need to cut those sinful and worldly influences out of our lives that choke, grieve, quench the Spirit of God. We, we've got to cut it off or we're not going to be able to do this. And you know how important it is that we do this. It's important not only for those we seek to reach, but it's important for us too because our reward in heaven, and we might say, you know, uh, you know how we save up for retirement in, in this life so that we can have an enjoyable retirement. Well, what about our retirement plan for heaven? You know, are we storing up there that we might be able to enjoy those things forever? Do we want to stand on the day of judgment with all of our works built upon this foundation of Christ and have nothing there but wood, hay, stubble that gets <clears throat> burned up in the fire and it's all gone and we're still saved but with no reward? Is that the kind of future we want? Or do we want things there that are precious that will endure? Uh, our embracing this and doing this work has consequences for us as well throughout eternity, and we need to think about these things, all of these things, to motivate us to reach out to others with this truth that they might come to know and love Jesus Christ as well and begin to help others find Him. You know, think about the condition of our nation. It's not going to change unless people's hearts change. And the only thing that God uses to change hearts is His gospel being made powerful by His Holy Spirit, but the messengers that He has entrusted this message to have to get that message out. We're the ones that have it. And so as the Lord gives us opportunity, especially at this time of the year, let's do our best to get that message out. Perhaps uh, with the Lord's blessing, if He is willing to bless us in this endeavor, we will be able to uh, give birth as His bride to spiritual children. You know, we, we are, as it were, a chosen lady as well. We're the bride of Christ. And it's our hope that we will have spiritual children that are walking in the ways of the Lord according to His commandments and giving glory to Him. I mean, may the Lord grant this entire nation might do that. But it does start with us. So we need to get that message out. May the Lord give us the grace uh, to do that. Well, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's, uh, let's ask the Lord to apply His Word to us.